Good morning. If you're joining now, uh, welcome. We're going to give everyone just another minute here to log on and then we'll get started. Looks like we've got a few more folks joining us. So let's go ahead and get started here. Well, good morning and happy fall to all of you guys joining us today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy weeks to be with us for a little bit this morning. Uh, we are excited to be back with you all for our quarterly webinar series. I'm Katie Coverad, financial planner with Paradigm Wealth Partners, and I'm joined this morning by John Bedner and Jonathan Bedner, owners of the firm. They need no introduction. You guys know them really well. Um, so today we're going to be talking about fixed income investing. We have a number of questions that we want to cover with you all this morning. Um, but I do want to say up front, if you have any additional questions, whether they're related to fixed income or not, we do want to give you a chance to voice those. And um, so go ahead and type those into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to those questions at the end of the webinar. Um, so before we jump into our conversation around bonds, we wanted to start today by just giving a few quick positive updates. I think we could all just use a little bit of good news right about now. Um, so the first update that we wanted to share with you all is that on September 27th, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services released the 2023 standard monthly premiums for Medicare Part B, um, which will be set at $164.90, and that is a decrease from the 2022 premiums. So that's some good news. Um, as well, the deductible for Medicare Part B beneficiaries has been set at $226 for 2023, which is also a decrease from 2022's deductibles. So some good news there. Um, in addition to that, as you all probably know, the Social Security Administration each year announces a cost of living adjustment that's known as the COLA. Last year, as you may know, the increase was about 5.9%, and this next increase for next year will officially be announced um, next week on October 13th, but it, many are projecting that it will be somewhere between 8 and 9% for this next year. Um, either way, it could be the largest Social Security COLA since 1981. So if you're taking Social Security, that's some good news for you to help try and keep pace with inflation. Um, so some good news there. We also did want to share, you know, some perspective around recession. If you've turned on the news at all in the last few months or even longer, you know, we just keep hearing recession, 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 and a lot of doom and gloom. And so we really wanted to address today how a recession impacts market returns and really by looking at historical data. So I'm going to go ahead and share a chart with you. Hopefully you all can see that. Um, this is from Ben Carlson's blog, A Wealth of Common Sense. Um, and really, it's showing the returns from the S&P 500 at different time periods um, throughout a recession. So let me see if I can annotate this here real quick. See if it'll let me do that. Basically, it's showing you um, at six months prior to a recession what the market returns look like during the recession and then post-recession at one years, three years, five years, and 10 years. See if I can get this up here. So what we wanted to point out to you was first of all what those returns looked like during the recession, which you'll see. There we go, right in this column here. Um, so we can see kind of the differences from each of these recessionary points in the economy of how the S and P 500 performed. And really, the main point here that we also wanted to show you was at one year post recession most of those returns are positive with the exception of here in 2001 and um, pretty nice returns as well and then if you go even further out to three five and ten years you know incredible returns across the board and really what we wanted to show based on the historical data is that for the long-term goal focused investor really this time is an opportunity you know for folks who are investing in good quality companies um, companies that can innovate and be creative and bounce back from a time period like this. And so hopefully this sheds another perspective that's got a little bit more of a positive um, light to it. So Jonathan, I know you had some additional thoughts on this. Would you like to share that? Uh, yeah, thanks for sh for sharing this. I know that we've sent this out many times over the last you know six to eight months, but I think it's important to come back and kind of remember uh, where we are and and really what forward looks like. And now we, we obviously can't guarantee that a year and three and five and 10 years will be positive. But if we look at this track record, we've got 11 out of 12 years, one year later is positive and, and pretty substantially. Um, and then when you look out 10 years, um, those, those gains are um, very impactful for 
clients' portfolios and, and retirement income needs. Uh, and, and, you know, the money is there to help support, uh, support retirement. So um, while the day-to-day -day news can be scary, I think having some perspective about uh, just where we are, and, and essentially these bear markets last, uh, or recessions can last somewhere between, you know, 12 and 18 months. Well, at this point, we're nine months into this thing. Uh, and so my personal belief is, you know, we're, we're probably at least the halfway mark, if not better. Uh, and I, I think, and I can't guarantee, but I think one year from now, we're going to see a market that looks drastically different to the, to the better side uh, than we are today. So, you know, I'm optimistic. I've said that, you know, many times through, you know, client conversations and the emails we've sent, but I just think it's important to kind of come back to this and, and remember the perspective. Um, the couple other things I would like to add, um, and, and let me look down to my notes so I don't forget, but um, the federal, not the Federal Reserve, the the, the companies uh, in our domestic markets today have increased their share buybacks by over $1 trillion, or they've actually hit $1 trillion in share buybacks as of the end of June, uh, this, this most recent second quarter. And the reason that that is important is because, number one, $1 trillion in share buybacks is the most in history that companies have ever done. So that's huge. Um, but what it actually means is these companies are taking their own money and instead of spending some of it in R&D, which, which they are, they're still looking at you know, ways to innovate and drive change and, and you know, do some research and development, but they're also taking some of that money and they're saying, well, my stock's down 25, 30, 40, 50% this year. And they're saying, my own stock's cheap. So let's just buy some of that while it's down. Now, the reason that benefits you if you're continuing to hold your stocks, which we advocate, is that... Um, it drives earnings per share. So if there's less shares outstanding because the company went and bought shares off the market, there's fewer shares, which means when they announce earnings, earnings will be higher based on fewer shares. So that's actually a net positive. And when we see companies that are continuing to buy their shares down on top of raising their dividends up, those are the kind of companies that we think provide really long-term growth perspective um, for your account. So I think that is... You know, something that we've seen, we've we've seen that trend happen, and I think that's a positive. Uh, and it's something that's kind of buried down in the surface that you may not necessarily see very easily. Uh, the next thing is uh, dividends are, are set to, to be close to $150 billion this year, which is the most uh, dividends have ever been paid. So while the news is bad and the stock prices are down, you're actually seeing a lot of resilience from companies who are still making money, turning around, reinvesting their own shares, but then also continuing to pay out those dividends to uh, to shareholders. Uh, and, and many of those, you know, that we own, not only pay their dividend, but they increase their dividend every year. Um, and I think they've got plenty of free cash flow to be able to do that. So I think those are kind of two nuggets that are hidden in here that I think are positives um, for how we've structured portfolios and, and just give some optimism about, you know, where we are and where we think we're going. Well, let me throw in a little tidbit here before we wind this segment down. Uh, really, a couple of things I will say that, number one, if you do go out and look at a five-year or the 10-year numbers that, you know, this chart shows, uh, or even the three years, or frankly, even the one year, now really represents an opportunity for us. So, Jonathan, you made the comment that, you know, with all the bad news. Well, there's good news. The good news is we have opportunity to reinvest dividends at much cheaper prices. And then if you look out one year, three years, five years, 10 years, the historical numbers, reinvesting now has paid huge dividends. So that's the one thing I want to tell you that, if, you know, everything is not doom and gloom. And what we've seen is really just the normal economic cycles where the markets go up and the markets go down based on the economy and what's going on as that relates to interest rates and inflation. So I don't think it's all bad. In fact, I look at this as a very opportunistic time for people invested now to continue to reinvest and stay the course. But additionally, equally and also important is now is a good time to start an investment program or to put money to work. Uh, because if you're buying with the market down on the S&P 500, approximately 24%, you know, that's a pretty big discount. And if you saw Cadillac Escalades go on sale from $100,000 down to uh, you know, 50000 and you were a person of means, you know, that would be a good opportunity for you to go buy a new car, whether it's an Escalade or a Volkswagen. It doesn't matter. If you see those kind of discounts and prices, there's your opportunity to go buy. So two things I would say. 
One, reinvesting dividends right now is an opportune uh, time to take advantage of that. Two, if you've been sitting there in you know, short-term interest rates for the last several years because you're afraid of this market, I think now is a very good time to start putting money to work, especially if you look at this chart again, one, three, and five years with a well-diversified portfolio that meets your investment goals and objectives. All right, we're going to switch gears here and jump into our conversation around fixed income investing. Um, the first question came from a client comment just around kind of basic asset allocation and trying to understand, you know, I thought bonds were supposed to be up when stocks were down. What's going on? Why are they down at the same time? Um, and it is rare that both stocks and bonds are down at the same time. In fact, this is the first time that we've actually seen both asset classes down for three consecutive months. So this is kind of unusual. So Jonathan, can you address the first question of why haven't bonds performed better this year? Yeah, when we go back really the last 40 years, uh, this started really back in the 1970s. We had high inflation. In order to combat that inflation, what we saw in the early 80s was Paul Vol Volker, Volker raise rates drastically to get that inflation under control. If you remember back in the 80s, we had rates at, you know, 12, 15, 18%. And so bond yields at that time, fixed income yields were very, very high. Um, and so as bond price or as yields have come down over the last 40 years, we have seen bonds appreciate in value. And so, you know, if you bought in the 80s, not only were you clipping 15% interest, but as the bond went down, your bond was more valuable. Someone would rather have a 15% bond, a bond paying 15% than they would a bond paying 10. Um, and so we've really been like a 40 year bull market or positive market for bonds. And what's happened over the last 10 years is that we've basically been at a zero interest rate policy by the Fed. We've done quantitative easing, which is financial jargon for the Federal Reserve has been very loose and accommodating in their monetary policy. They have kept rates very, very low coming out of the Great Recession in 2007, 8, and 9 uh, to stimulate the market, to get people to spend money, to get people to invest, to buy properties, to, to, to build properties, to, uh, to, to encourage companies to do more R&D. Um, and what's happened over, the, and then they also bought bonds off of banks' balance sheets, which gave banks more money to then go out and lend. Um, so we've been very, very uh, accommodating in the way that the monetary policy has been for the last 10 years. Um, but that's kept rates at near zero. So you've had bank accounts pay virtually nothing. You've had CDs pay virtually nothing. Money market pay virtually nothing. You, you had to go into, they call it TINA, there is no other alternative for investing in equities or reaching for yield. Um, and, and that can be a dangerous place. We don't feel like we've been in that. We feel like we've been in very good quality companies. Um, but there are a lot of companies that pay high, high dividends that I would not consider something to be really an adequate investment because I feel like they could cut their dividend, especially when we start to key, you know, some, some recessionary fears like we have now. In this 40 year bull market for bonds where yields have gone down and prices have gone up, uh, we get to this point where we've had zeros for the last 10 years. Couple that with the stimulus that we've done through the, the pandemic, we had PPP loans, we had, um, you know, direct stimulus payouts. We have a most recent headline of, you know, somewhere between three and $400 billion in student loan forgiveness. So we've got all kinds of kind of direct stimulus money and all that does is create more inflation. So that's where, you know, we've gotten, you know, also to, you know, two decade, three decade highs uh, on an inflation number. And so what the Fed has done has uh, kind of not full Paul Walker yet, but aggressively raise these rates to try to curb inflation to prevent a 1970s style stagflation. And what that's done is it's caused bond prices to go down. Now bonds are already, at, you know, zero. And so that's actually caused bonds to sell off drastically. Interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So that's where we're seeing this spread now. And since we've been at zero for so long, we're seeing a flight out of these bonds, which are losing value. They were paying one and 2% the last 10 years. Now you can sell the bond, not lose money, and you can go over to money market or savings or CD and get, or treasuries and get, you know, two and three and 4%. So that's really why we're seeing, you know, these bond prices go down. And really, as the Fed continues to raise rates, I've said this really all along, the story right now is Fed and inflation. As long as Fed is raising the rates, we're going to continue to see volatility uh, in this market. The uh, 
the tidbit I would say, or I would add to it, very simply put, if you own a bond paying 2% and interest rates on that same quality and maturity of bond go to 5% on the new ones, you've got a bond that you don't want anymore and neither does anybody else. And the only way you're going to sell that bond is to sell it at a loss. So that's essentially what we're seeing in the bond market to you know, make a, a little bit more clear. We also expect that rates will probably go up a couple of more times, November and December, um, although it may not be 75 basis points or three quarters of a point, but more rate hikes would drive the values of bonds down even more. Um, but as the values go down, there's also opportunity to buy bonds with even higher yields. And I'll give you a quick example. If you got a $10 bond that pays a $1 dividend, that's 10% on your money. If that bond drops to $5, the price, and it still pays a $1 dividend, that's 20% on your money. So if we see rates higher again in November and December and bond prices come down, there is an opportunity there for us to pick up bonds with definite maturities with higher yields because prices are lower. So I want you to know that there's good news in that too. Now you go from a zero or 1% to possibly a three, four, and five on the fixed income portion of your portfolio. That makes a big difference to add stability to the portfolio going forward. And if you're in bonds or bond investments now, and you're reinvesting dividends, as bond prices come down in the example I just gave from a price of 10 to five, and you had a 10% yield at 10 and the price drops five, but it still pays a dollar, that's a 20% yield. The same applies with your current bond investments. If the values of the bonds inside your portfolio drop and you reinvest dividends or your interest, I should say, back into the same investment, buying more bonds, your yield goes higher. So everything in the short term, everything to include stocks may look bad, but in the long term, frankly, it works to your best interest if you stay the course. And that's the point we'll make. The FOMC and j Powell are trying to prevent a scenario that, as Jonathan referenced, happened in the 70s. Sure, everybody made 15, 16, 70 percent on those interest rates, but inflation was 1 percent below what they were earning. So if you earn 15 and inflation was 4, you really made 1 percent on your money. 14. Uh, yeah, excuse me, 14 percent. If, if inflation was 14 percent and you were earning 15, then your real rate of return was 1%. You made 1% on your money after inflation. So that's what they're trying to, to make sure that they stop. And that is runaway inflation where a loaf of bread eventually gets to the point where it's $1,500. It doesn't matter how much money you got, you're gonna run out. And of course that's an oversimplification, but they are trying to combat uh, a 1970s scenario where inflation is run wild. So that's really kind of how we got here. Uh, so at this current time, and it all relates to interest rates being zero, you know, people would go to the market stocks to buy higher yields and better returns than zero on money market or CDs or negligible returns, I should say. Maybe not zero, but two tenths of 1% might as well be zero. So that was driving the market up. And then you had all this money printing and the money printing and zero interest rates are what have caused this inflation. That's how we got here. If you're raising interest rates on the one hand and printing train loads of $100 bills on the other hand and doling those train loads of $100 bills out, you, you're not doing anything to stop inflation. It, raising rates and printing money uh, at the same time are probably counterproductive because you're not, you're really not stopping inflation when you're handing everybody so much money. So, I mean, I could, we could talk about this all day long, you know, the pros and the cons and compare and contrast, but th the essence of it is they're trying to stop a 1970s scenario. And that's why bonds are acting poorly because interest rates are going up and the values of the bonds are going down and you need to turn that whole scenario around. So it works in your favor rather than against you. Yeah. All right. We are going to move on to our second question here. We're kind of just taking it back to the basics and the fundamentals. Uh, so the question, Jonathan, for you is, what is a bond? Very simple. So a bond is an IOU. Um, this is, uh, I call this, a, you're a loaner, not an owner. 
So you're loaning a company or a government or a municipality, um, you know, some, some business, some entity, a sum of money. And in return for that sum, you'll earn a, a stated interest rate for a select period of time. Um, there's, there's bonds or, or, you know, treasury bills from three months all the way to 30 year bonds. The government's talked about doing 50 and hundred year bonds. I don't think that happens at least with rates being higher, but you know, essentially a bond is just an IOU. So you loan, you know, XYZ <laughs> company, $10,000. And over that, you know, let's say 10 year period, you're going to earn a stated interest rate. Um, and then at the end of that period, you get your $10,000 back. So it, it's really just an IOU. You have no ownership in the long-term growth of that company. If it's corporate bond, um, if it's a government, you obviously won't own the government. You just are loaning them some money. So that is in itself what a bond is. All right. The next question is for John. Uh, what are the different types of bonds and how should I compare them? Well, you know, there are really a multitude of different kinds of bonds. But generally speaking, you know, we see bonds in three classes. Government bonds, by and large, AAA rated, you know, very, very safe, uh, backed by the full faith in government, a uh, full faith and credit of the, you know, U.S. Treasury. And in the history of the United States, the government has never defaulted on one of its, you know, bonds. First time they do, we're all in trouble. So a government bond, that's probably the safest one you can buy, but it's... Uh, the one that pays the least amount of interest because it has the least amount of risk. Corporate bonds are another class of bonds and corporations, Walmart as an example, may issue bonds to finance their inventory. So, and I'm just using this as an oversimplification, but they will take them, they will sell a bond, take the money and go buy inventory to sell. And then they'll pay the bond back or interest on the bond. So there's government bonds that the government uses to finance its operations. There's corporate bonds and corporations like Coca-Cola and Walmart and Caterpillar and all these people issue bonds to finance their operations. And like Jonathan said, it's an I I IOU. Uh, and then the last category I'll mention just in passing are tax-free bonds. Municipalities by and large will issue bonds to maybe finance a new stadium or a new bridge. And then uh, a new hospital, and there's different types of bonds along those lines, but for simplicity's sake, government bonds, corporate bonds, and tax-free bonds, I think are the three main uh, bond classes that we talk about today. So I hope yep. that answers the question. I didn't really talk about ratings. Uh, Jonathan, you may want to speak a little bit to ratings, but basically I'll give you a nutshell. And if I miss anything, Jonathan, you come back and correct me. Standard and Poor's and Moody's both rate bonds. And the highest rating you can get on a bond is AAA. And that's e either an insured bond or typically a government-backed bond. So you've got really a very, very safe investment. That's AAA. The next is AA, still very, very high quality. Single A, again, still high quality. And then it goes down to B. So anything B is called investment grade. We see a lot of those. Um, uh, personally, we like them. They're investment grade. They're good quality. And we tell people really not to go below triple B in rating. So triple A, single A, double A, and excuse me, triple B, single A, double A, and triple B going up the spectrum are good quality bonds that we tell people uh, are investments that you should have in your portfolio in the fixed income sleeve with part of your money. Below uh, triple B, we really try to stay away from because those are junk bonds. And I think, Katie, that was one of your questions. And junk bonds pay substantially more interest, but there's substantially more risk. There's, you know, the risk of default, and that's what you're really concerned about, missing an interest rate payment. Uh, if you see that happen, that bond will drop dramatically in price. So the three different kinds of bonds and then the ratings are very, very important when you're considering bonds. And you really need to have a clear understanding about the quality of bond you're buying, the interest rate you're buying, and the maturity that you're buying. Because you have to understand, as we've spoken in this webinar today, as interest rates go up, the values of the bonds will go down. So you need to really fully understand what you're doing, how it works. And that's where we come in and try to advise you about how best uh, to structure the bond sleeve of your portfolio. 
Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so that kind of just leads us right into our next question. You know, you covered some of the risks, especially with um, bonds that are rated below a triple B. Again, just to recap, triple B or higher falls into that investment grade, and that's where we focus. Um, so talking about risks, Jonathan, can you speak to what are some of the other risks associated with bond investing? Yeah, so bonds have a couple of different risks. Dad hit on uh, default risk, which is essentially the risk of you know, the bond missing a interest payment, which could be quarterly um, or, or more likely semi-annually, twice a year. Um, and then, you know, sometimes they'll pay just an annual rate, but it's usually uh, a, a semi-annual. So a default risk could be them not paying that um, one of those interest payments. But more so, once that starts happening, now we actually start thinking about, does the bond totally default and go worthless? And so that's where that junk bond really comes in that dad spoke about a second ago was the actual risk of your bond going to zero i talked earlier about volatility and risk and i'll lead into this here in a second with with interest rate risk but in our mind volatility and risk are two totally different things volatility is just the price movement based on factors going on in the economy and the market uh and you'll see prices either or, or, or values either go up or down and that's just that's normal that's volatility risk is the actual chance that your investment goes to zero so we actually do not equate risk and volatility together but a lot of the talking heads on tv make it sound like those are the same thing and they're really not but that's led us into what we're seeing now and that's interest rate risk so this is the second kind of risk and as rates go up bond prices go down so that's the the risk of interest rates uh having an impact on your portfolio now just because the value goes down doesn't mean the bond is bad what it means is it's it's trading at less value if you had to sell it today, but bonds have maturities. So you could be one year, three year, five year, 10 years away from that bond maturity. And as long as you hold that bond to maturity, you'll get your $10,000 back, like I mentioned earlier. So it doesn't matter necessarily what the intraday pricing is of these bonds. What we're looking at is how long of bonds do we own? Um, and you know the interest rate you're getting our goal is to hold hold that bond until it matures and collect that interest rate but interest rate risk is one of the other types of risk um the other is you know reinvestment risk if your bond pays off um then you may not be able to buy a bond at the same rate now right now as rates are going up if you have a bond maturing you're probably able to go buy a bond with a higher interest rate so you don't have a lot of that risk right now but if we see the fed cut rates Again, let's just say that they stem us into a recession. We'll see them cut rates, try to stimulate spending again. Um, and if you've got bonds maturing then, then now we're at a risk of trying to buy a bond at a, at a cheaper interest rate. And so there's a couple of different risks there. I think the biggest two risks in my mind are credit risk and default risk. Credit risk being, are you buying good quality, double B, single A, double A, did I say double B, triple B, single A, double A, triple A? Are you buying good quality? Are you buying junk? You know, we we advocate and, and encourage people to buy uh, good quality bonds. There's just not a lot of reason to take risk um, chasing some of these these riskier bonds. And then the other risk, the, the, the biggest one is, is default risk, the risk of it just going out of business and not paying that, you know, that payment back to you, that that principal back to you. So those are the two main risks uh, or three main risks um, but that we see in the fixed income. But if you're buying good quality bonds, as Katie said, triple B and above, and you do see fluctuation in value, the value going down, um, again, whether it's an individual bond that has a definite maturity and you know you're going to get your principal back, or you're reasonably assured you're going to get your principal back, uh, then there's really no reason to panic uh, and worry about selling your bond. And if you're in a bond fund and you've got hundreds of bonds in the portfolio, even if the value goes down, when one or two of those bonds matures, it's going to go out and buy a higher bond, a higher yielding bond, because rates are higher. So you're still going to take that money and average your income up or reinvest and buy bonds at a cheaper price. And I liken this to your house. You know, if your house drops 25% in value or 30% or 40%, you don't call a realtor to tell them to come out, look at your house, and hurry up, put it on the market because it's down in value. That's not what you do. You keep your house, you live in your house, you make it be part of your, your plan and your strategy that you want to employ 
you know, going forward. You don't run out and sell your house because it's down in value. And the same thing with your portfolio. As I said earlier in the meeting and the webinar, I look at this time right now as an opportunity for everybody, whether it's bonds, fixed income investments, or whether it is uh, equities, stocks, or mutual funds, either bonds or stocks or some combination. Now's the opportunity if we go back to look at that chart again, where we see the returns one, three, five, and 10 years, any interest from the bonds that you reinvest, uh, history has shown has paid huge dividends. Any uh, dividends you reinvest from the stocks, buying more stocks with you know cheaper prices, history has shown over one, three, five, and 10 years, that's been a winning strategy. So while nothing feels good right now, I remind you that this is normal. We've seen it before over and over and over. It's normal economic cycles. And uh, the market has really done one thing for the last hundred years, and that's go up, even though we've seen volatility. And I really don't understand, Jonathan and Katie, what is going to make it change over the next hundred years, short of Armageddon and nuclear war. And if that's the case, it's not going to matter how much money any of us have or where it is. That's right. <laughs> Thanks, John. All right. So we've talked about what is a bond. We've talked about the risks of bond investing. We've talked about different types of bonds. The last thing that we wanted to touch on today is bond laddering. Now, if you've been in a recent review meeting with us, you've, we've probably already talked to you about our strategy around this, but we did want to cover it today. So, John, I'm going to start with you. I'd like you to explain what is a bond ladder, and then maybe, Jonathan, you can speak to how is it used as an effective strategy. Um, thank you, Katie. A, a bond ladder is essentially taking your money and buying a one year, as an example, a two year, a three year, a four year, and a, a five year. So let's just assume somebody had $50,000 in my example here. You would put 10,000 in a one year bond, 10,000 in a two year, 10,000 in a three year, 10,000 in a four, and 10,000 in a five. All the money's invested. Now, because you've done that, the first thing you've done is given yourself an average rate that's going to be higher than if you had all the money in one year or two year maturities. So you got an average rate that's going to be higher than very short term. Number two, you got 20% of that money coming due every year. At the end of the first year, the one year bond maturity you bought is going to come due. When it comes due, you're going to go buy a five year bond, five year maturity. That'll be a higher rate. So you're averaging your income up. At the end of the second year, your two year maturity that you bought will come due. You'll go buy another five year with that. So you're averaging your income higher, assuming rates are going up and long term rates pay more than short term. And then when the third year rolls around and that one matures, you go buy a five year. The four year maturity comes around, you take that and go buy a five year. And when the fifth year maturity rolls around, you take that and go buy another five year. Now you got all your money in five years maturities, typically at higher rates than, than one in two years. And even with all in five years, the first five year maturity that you bought uh, with your one year that came due, you're going to have that mature and you continued by as each one of those years goes by a five year when all the money is in five year paper or five year maturities, you still got 20% coming due every single year because you bought them and you staggered when you bought them every year. I hope that's not confusing, but the bottom line is once you get it all in five year maturities, you got 20% coming due every year. If interest rates are going up, you average your rate higher every time you have a maturity. If interest rates are going down, you protect yourself because you've got longer dated maturity. So your income stays higher or longer. Did that, was that confusing? Yeah, there's, a, you'll, using the bond ladder, you'll never have all your money in five year bonds. No. You will always have a one, two, three, four, and five in this example. Um, so I, I just wanted to make that clarification. Well, well, then when you start out, you will have a one, two, three, four, and five year. You'll always have it. Cause when the one year matures, you go buy a new five year. Now your two year is a one year bond. You will always have a one, two, three, four, and five. I understand, years. but the original investments were, were five years after they mature. I, I don't want to confuse the issue. Uh, I see what you're saying. You basically got one year rolling, but it was on five year maturities. Correct. Jonathan, any additional thoughts that you want to add around the strategy for bond laddering? Yeah, so so I think the big question we've gotten is, is you know, why did we make this switch? And we made this switch um, in, you know, early first quarter of this year 
uh, or late first quarter, early second quarter, really before the Fed started start aggressively, you know, raising rates. We've seen three 75 basis points or three quarters of a percent rate hikes in a row. And that was June, July, and September. I don't know what we'll get in November on November 2nd. My guess is it's 50 basis points or half a percent, um, but they're going to be data dependent. And, and I think they're targeting a four to four and a half percent Fed funds rate. Now, the Fed funds rate is what the, what the Federal Reserve charges banks to use federal money in order to pay its operating expenses and use for loans. So as those rates go higher, it, it, it eats into the profit margin of the banks somewhat, makes it more expensive for them to access that money. And that trickles down to everything else. Um, so everything most, else most notably mortgages and cars. So rates on all those go up and it is designed to slow down the demand. And if you slow down the demand enough because you raise rates high enough, then hopefully you slow down inflation. So what we had what we had done up until you know early this year was own these perpetual bond funds because we could get more interest rate uh, or interest, higher interest rates uh, on the fixed income side. And what we saw early on was that as the Fed was raising rates, these bond prices were going to get hit pretty hard. And, and to this day, we've had the worst bond sell-off we've ever had. Fortunately for us, you know, for, for most of the year, um, from, from our execution of selling these, these bonds has been in cash. And so we've advocated this is our war chest. This is a place for us to have some stability, but it's also a place for opportunity. You know, where can we take advantage of you know, what's going on in the marketplace. So we got together as a firm and we, we really started looking at, you know, these bond ladders and how can we leverage these so that we've got definite maturities. Um, and, and, and we used a 2023 through a, or 2022 through a 2026 um, and split the money between those four or five different bond funds. And so as each one of those years happens, that sleeve of money comes due or matures or pays back to the account at which time we can then make the decision, a couple of different things. One, you don't need the money. We take those proceeds and we go buy the next rung on the ladder. That's really kind of probably the, the, the main thought process. The second idea is that if you need money, then you know the 2022 matures and now that serves as 2023's income for you. So every year we've got you know your segment of income coming due to cash. Um, and we're not taking on a lot of risk by making it segmented in those time blocks. The, the third thing it does is it lets us earn something on the investment while we wait for an opportunity. And while I think now is, you know, an okay an opportunity to, to start nibbling, I don't necessarily know that it makes sense for everybody to step in right now. Some of that depends on obviously your risk tolerance and, and how much you already have invested and what your current asset allocation is. But I think if you have a 22 or 23 bond, what we're starting to do is say, okay, if we're not going to buy anything right now, we at least are earning some interest on that on that money versus sitting in cash, still earning basically nothing. But we can sell that 22 or 23 bond, and we can deploy it into the market when an opportunity persists. And that's really where we're looking at now. Uh, and as dad mentioned really early on, um, is, is as opportunities present themselves, if we already have some cash left over, we can start nibbling. We've already done this for clients. If we run out of that dry powder, the next thing is to sell the lowest maturity bond. And in this case, it'd be either the 22 or the 2023 bond and deploy that money and slowly nibble in. Now we wanna be careful that we don't get, you know, overextended and push you into an allocation that's far more aggressive than, you know, you really wanna be. But I would argue with, when we're already down 25 or 30%, um, not to say that we can't go substantially lower, but I think we're, we're buying things are much more attractive than they were you know, six months and a year ago. So taking some of this opportunity to nibble, I think is a good idea. Um, so I think this really serves as, as three uh, strategies really in one. One is to have your fixed income working for you in definite maturities versus perpetual and lasting forever, uh, which we believe has higher risk. Um, second is a way to generate income in your needed years in retirement. Um, think of it as like a five years of income set aside with money coming due every year during that five years to sustain that year's worth of income needs. And then third would be a place to hold money to earn something while we wait for the opportunities to buy some of the investments that you know we're, we're keeping an eye on. So 
that's really how we think of this strategy uh, for for you. And in, in conclusion, I would say that you just have to keep everything in perspective. If we look out three, five, 10 years, we expect every client, in fact, every investor to do very, very well, whether they are an account with us or with somebody else, you just have to take a longer term perspective. If your time horizon is not three, five, 10 years, and it's very short, one or two years, I would advise that you not be investing in the market, period. So you, if you look at over three, five, and 10 years, I, I concede and, and believe that, that you will be fine and in fact, do very well. But over six months or a year or two years, I've got no idea really what the returns are going to look like, either positive or negative. I, I'll, I'll throw in one more thing. And this is uh, one of my colleagues, Nick, what, one of the things that he mentions and I think I, I like it, or I wouldn't say it, but it's the idea of a six, five, four, you know, six months worth of emergency fund that helps, uh, you know, kind of stop gate, uh, any, any major income needs or cash flow needs. If you've got that emergency fund, you can, you know, use it. Um, so six months of that, five years worth of kind of these fixed income expenses to help weather, you know, market fluctuations in, in you know, the next five years worth of retirement. And then, you know, the four is forever, which is our favorite holding period for, you know, these, these companies, these, these investments. And so it, I, you know, I saw Nick post that and comment on that. And I thought it was really clever. Um, and so I think that's kind of the way that I think about, you know, structuring portfolios, six months worth, worth of emergency fund, five years worth of fixed income to cover, you know, income needs, and then holding our stocks forever and letting them continue to work for you uh, and grow for you over time. All right. Thank you both for sharing your insights. I think that was really helpful. Again, you know, you've heard us say this multiple times, but we just encourage you guys to stay disciplined, stay the course. If you have any questions that we didn't get to today, um, please reach out to John, Jonathan, or myself. We do want to make sure we're connecting with each of you. Um, we thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us, and we will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye.